Morris Conley, I'm the EU Affairs Researcher at the IIEA, and I spoke with our Director General, David O'Sullivan, about his key takeaways from the State of the European Union Address by Ursula von der Leyen, President of the European Commission. So, looking at the themes of the speech, I think strategic autonomy was one of the major ones. Are we looking at a more muscular European Union in terms of economic policy, possibly economic intervention, with some of the proposals? I think there's no doubt but that the stage is back mm -hmm. uh, post-pandemic, uh, post the, 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 the well, with the war in Ukraine, uh, that there is a strong case for more public intervention. Um, I think she did a very good job of, of putting the notion of strategic autonomy in context. In other words, we cannot be excessively vulnerable to external dependence, uh, whether that's oil and gas from Russia, whether that's rare earths from China, or even uh, uh, other uh, products. We, we, we have to develop a, a capacity to produce some of this stuff ourselves, not all of it, and we have to make some choices, and that's not easy. Uh, she mentioned the batteries as, a, as an example of a success. Will the chips uh, have the same success? It needs a lot of money, but uh, it's, it's, it's highly ambitious. Uh, but also to diversify our supplies, and so to build uh, relationships around the world that enable us never to go back to uh, being excessively dependent on one supplier who may turn out not to be a friend. And I think in that sense, she's made strategic autonomy um, something more understandable mm -hmm. than simply an abstract thing of, well, we, we depend less on, you know, we're less reliant on America or whatever. Uh, it's, it's, it's about our ability to continue our way of life with less risk of, of being destabilized by the bad behavior of some key partner. In terms of the foreign relations of the European Union, in terms of like the US with the UK, Russia, China, further abroad, etc., do you see any changes coming there from the enlargement agenda to kind of Europe's place in the world, Europe's place in the world? Yeah, country? I mean, obviously, um, the immediate challenge we face is is the neighbourhood, because we have this ring. Do I use maybe Binchy's expression? We have a circle of friends. <laughs> Um, but who are, you know, looking for different types of friendship. Mm -hmm. So we have the countries that want to join the European Union desperately, the Western Balkans, now Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, we have Turkey. Do they still want to join the European Union? Are we still keen to have them in the European Union? And then we have the countries who are very important partners, but who clearly don't want to join the European Union. So the UK is the perfect example because they just left. Yeah. But we have Switzerland, mm -hmm. and we have Norway. So how we kind of build all of this into some kind of coherent, um, wider European circle, that's the idea of the European political community, mm -hmm. which will meet in Prague on the 6th of October. Let us see where that idea goes. And then, of course, we have Europe's place in the world, obviously. Um, I thought she was quite outspoken on China, mm -hmm. uh, pointing to China rather as a source of, of concern mm -hmm. than as a, a sort of important partner, which we sometimes refer to. She didn't say too much about the United States, um, but clearly the war in Ukraine has made the relationship, the transatlantic relationship, ever more important. On the other hand, we cannot ignore what is happening in domestic American politics. We don't know what the midterms will bring. We don't know, more importantly, what 2024 will bring. And if we were to find ourselves with uh, Mr. Trump back in the White House or a, a Trump 2.0, um, you know, that could change that dynamic. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I, I thought overall she, she got the, the, the balance right on that today, uh, at particularly the emphasis on our immediate neighborhood, because that is the area over which we can have most direct influence. And I think a final question would be the prospect of treaty reform, the idea of opening up a convention in the European Treaty Group, inserting a clause on intergenerational solidarity. Is that a likely prospect? Do we see something coming out of that? Uh, look, I think it would be very courageous to, mm. to, to put the prospect of a new European Convention on the table. We know it's controversial. Uh, we know many member states do not want to, to go near treaty change because it could mean a referendum uh, or, or, or a difficult domestic debate uh, in one form or another. Uh, on the other hand, she's absolutely right that it, you know, if we want to enlarge, we will also have to reform. I was a bit surprised, to be honest with you, with the relatively narrow entry point to mm -hmm. the idea about intergenerational... I mean, we're not going to have a European Convention only on a, a clause of inter, intergenerational solidarity. It could be part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. But if you have a convention, it, clearly the, 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 the agenda will be much, much wider than that. So that just surprised me a little, the way it was presented. But uh, I think in, sooner or later, we're going to have to address the fact 
that our treaties as presently constituted are not fit for purpose of building a union of you know 20 37 countries uh, of the diversity from you know Portugal to um, to, to Moldova uh, uh, it, it's just it won't work so we're going to have to find a new way of working to to react adapt to that new reality perfect